Okay, um, welcome. Uh, especially, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Mark Simmons to UIC, especially after our barrage of activities at the end of last week. So, we're glad that everybody is wide eyed and bright eyed after having their heads around the usual stuff. Um, I think that in general, we're a school that strives to have a kind of experimental excellence in design, theory, and technology. So, uh, having the last few days, Neil Denari, Jeff Kipnis, and now Mark Simmons is the trifecta uh, of excellence in design, theory, and technology. So, that is a curriculum in a nutshell. So, uh, from now on, you can just take the rest of the year off. <laughs> I'm done. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> But check with your instructors first. Um, Mark is a partner in front, uh, a facade consulting practice based in New York uh, that he co-founded in 2002, and it now maintains an office also in San Francisco. He's, on the, and he's a faculty member at the Princeton School of Architecture. Mark received his Bachelor's of Environmental Design as well as his Professional Master of Architecture from the School of Architecture uh, at the University of Waterloo. Uh, before opening Front, he also worked for Norman Foster and Associates, Meinhardt Facade Technology. He was a member of the Structural Glass Consulting Group at Dewhurst and McFarland and Partners in New York. Although Mark's office is, for obvious reasons, called Front, in many ways they're really the force behind an impressive series of projects and names that you're all familiar with uh, and are well-known names to you. Uh, and Mark's office has contributed their expertise to projects, many projects by OMA, including Seattle, Prada, uh, CCTV, projects by Frank Gehry, by Sejima, Renzo Demeron, uh, 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 Renzo Piano, Neil Denari's own uh, project uh, HL23 that he showed on Thursday. Simply put, Mark is to surface what Cecil Bauman is to structure. The physical force behind it all that makes it happen. Uh, and if Alejandro Zayera Paula is correct, that the building envelope is the place where current architecture uh, meets its most uh, precise political formal dimension. In other words, the site where the confluence of uh, uh, extreme performative and representational obligations on architecture are the most. Um, then Mark is arguably fronting uh, the most significant architectural uh, operation today. While this will be, uh, lecture will be of interest to everyone, um, in particular, I should point it out to the second year grads. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, as you go on to translate your studio project next semester, as it gets in its uh, technical development, uh, but also I think the second year undergrads, um, uh, with their uh, high rise project, and of course, it is envelope week in theory this week, uh, so for selfish reasons, the scheduling is perfect. Uh, Mark tells me he has many sexy images, uh, as well as dirty little stories to tell. Uh, so we want, uh, with that promise, we want to be here as soon as possible. Um, but it's always a pleasure, though unfortunately a rare pleasure, uh, to welcome someone like Mark, who is selfless in making architects and architects look so good. So we need many more of you, Mark. Thank you very much. Structured in a way that we focus on the 
say, one material narrative, one system narrative, which I think becomes self-evident in the way that it kind of begins to tie into every other aspect of the work. So you can fill in all the blanks yourselves. Uh, as to our precise role in all of these projects, it's always different. Uh, the extent to which we're involved is a variable depth, a variable breadth, uh, various levels of responsibility. Um, and I, I can't really uh, describe that in full detail. So you just have to kind of intuitively understand how, how these things work. Because uh, the facade business is not particularly well defined. Everyone in the facade business tends to craft their own kind of uh, form of facade consulting. Uh, it's not um, governed by any kind of body, so to speak, so in the end, uh, the terms upon which you are retained uh, is very much a kind of negotiation between you and your client. What does your client need? What do they think they need? What can you offer them? What are your competencies? What are you actually really able to do that is different from somebody else? So how do you dovetail into a process from the outset is not clear, which is why 100% um, of our work tends to be by referral. Uh, it's always um, somebody who knows somebody who says to somebody, these guys might be able to help you out, why don't you give a call? And then you get to know each other and see if it's going to happen. The um, good thing about that is uh, our marketing budget is quite low. Uh, the bad thing about it is we're not really in control of um, who we work with and what kind of work we get. Uh, but that said, we're not complaining. Um, so, a little bit uh, right up front. As described, the company has been around for about eight years now. Uh, the partners, uh, Michael and uh, Bruce and myself, were actually all trained as architects. Um, uh, only one of us is actually currently licensed for factual verification, and then that in the UK. So we're not actually offering professional architectural services, nor are we offering professional engineering services, which is then quite peculiar as to why we can do what we do and that people trust us to do as much as we do, and that lots of other architects and engineers are willing to work in association with us um, uh, based on merit, I suppose. Because really, we're a professional corporation that we sell in. Right? We can be, you know, sell the sandwiches at lunch or anything that our corporation decides to do. Um, uh, just for your benefit, what you need to play in this arena is professional liability insurance. Um, if you don't have insurance, you can't do anything. And so when we started the company, and Graham hired us on uh, day four, day 28, uh, to do China Central Television, we didn't quite have our insurance put in place yet. So we had to figure that out very quickly. Um, and we wrote essays on how liability is assigned in the facade industry, which requires a very kind of subtle and forensic understanding of how the business works and how the whole industry works. And our, um, we then got certain reference letters from uh, you know, recognized structural engineers in New York City saying, yeah, these guys want to do it. So the insurance company said, yeah, something good bet. So, knock uh, on Keelan, we have uh, eight years with no claims in all the insane work that we're doing, no claims. My friend Scott Harville says we have the best business model in the world. So we get to do the coolest work. Um, with uh, absolutely no responsibility uh, and no financial risk. <laughs> so, in case you're interested, kind of weird. The, the, the underlying point of this, though, is it's about confidence. It is about actually knowing what you're doing. Would you stand by the microphone? Sorry. Uh, so, I'm not doing this one. Ah, there you go. Ah, no, no, no. It's a, thank you very much. Um, so, I don't know how to turn the microphone on. Is that all right? So in case you missed the first part, just ignore it. <laughs> I didn't say it, it didn't happen. Um, uh, but we, we do, uh, just for your reference, have a firm of 40 people, uh, of whom many of them are licensed uh, architects, and many of them are licensed structural engineers, um, which is also a prerequisite for our insurance companies. And I wanted to talk quickly about the kind of staff, the team, um, it's a multidisciplinary team. Now, you hear multidisciplinary all the time, and many, many companies, and not most, and some degree are multidisciplinary. But we don't have, say, an HVAC department, we don't have a BIM department, we don't have any of that. So we have uh, 
these people who all have interesting and diverse backgrounds. And I'll give you some examples, like uh, Evan recently joined us after working three years on the fuselage design for the Dreamliner, uh, which is pretty neat. It's kind of envelope work, I suppose. Uh, we have uh, Dario, who works for Augusto, which is one of the leading uh, helicopter manufacturers, uh, doing rear stabilizer and prototype design. Um, we have people with a computer engineering background, with uh, coding and scripting backgrounds. We have people with construction management backgrounds. We have uh, probably about a quarter of the office with some sort of structural engineering background. And even at that, some of them are specialists more in kind of nonlinear structures, other ones do finite element modeling. Uh, some of them are more into advanced kind of uh, systems, whether others are really just comfortable with structural glass and plates and frames and so forth. We have people who are from the facade industry, who actually are expert in kind of system design and understanding the principles of waterproofing and uh, constructability. Uh, we have people who are expert in information modeling, uh, who have a background in uh, CAD CAM, in uh, various kind of straight to fab stuff, CNC stuff, but also in terms of knowledge management infrastructure. Um, we have people who are doing graphic design. Uh, we have people who are doing um, business development stuff. Uh, so, and all those people just sit next to each other in a kind of more loose configuration. So, you know, you'll have a structural engineer over there, and he may have also been working for a contractor before, and this guy over there is from aerospace, but he doesn't really understand architectural uh, idiosyncrasies, and sometimes that's great because it keeps you very honest about why you're doing something. Um, so, this is not, um, I was describing earlier in the discussion with the students here, um, I don't believe that's a scalable model. It's a very peculiar uh, uh, model that we built for ourselves to engage in practice on the terms that we want to do the kind of work we want for our own personal pleasure. So in the end, it's about kind of constructing practice in a way that you want to engage it and then building kind of team and the competency in order to actually be able to do that work. So this is why when we have a, a very ambiguous identity for a design, people are wondering like, well, are, do we have a high level structural capability? Are we like Euro Hapo or are we like George McFarland? And you know, they're unsure. I mean, are we like dairy technologies? Can we do construction process modeling and information management? Uh, to some degree, yes. But GT's model is not our business model. We don't really want to do quite what they do. Um, shop construction. There's shop construction and shop architecture, and uh, their version of how they want to structure practice isn't the same as ours. A little bit, but not really. It's kind of quite different, and it's kind of core competency. We're not running the big architectural practice and doing planning work, and they are, and at the same time, they're not doing forensic industrial design and going, uh, you know, the level of detail that we need, for example. So every uh, company out there that's kind of uh, staking a claim to a certain kind of practice is doing it in its own kind of granular way. And I just want you to kind of understand that when we start with all the work. Okay, so let's just uh, jump into the uh, projects. Um, now, I, I, sometimes I structure the work in a way that makes sense, like by system or by material or by topology. And this time I said, um, I'm just going to do it randomly. So uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, this is the uh, Wiley Theater in Dallas, um, relatively recently open. If you've ever seen uh, Josh Williams present this, you'll recognize many of these slides. Uh, these are all for the uh, So one of the big challenges of this building is, if you've read the narratives about it, is we're sitting next to the Winspear Opera House, a gigantic building by Foster across the street. And the Dallas Theater Center really wants kind of uh, an iconic identity within a small wrap. So the building is super efficient from a volumetric standpoint, and we went for height, and the height, of course, creates this kind of like uh, multimodal theater space, which is what it's all about. And you stack all the program above, you have a theater in the middle, and you put the lobby in the below. So then, I tell you, working with theater projects, fantastic company, doing all the theater design work, uh, they're, they're owning the budget. Basically, the budget's going entirely into the interior mechanism to move everything they need to move and have a theater that operates without fail. After that, we have a facade. And the facade is simply a glass wall and something above. 
And there's a whole question about rain spins. And rain spins are one of the, kind of the most ubiquitous forms today that allows for huge amounts of exper experimentation. Uh, brings about the delivery of a, kind of a new Baroque in the form of like a crisis in form. It's like the fact that the facade can now be anything, what should it be? And I think actually it's what we're seeing a lot of today. So these models here represent a bit of that. Now, when we actually backed out of the budget, we had about 20 bucks a square foot for this wall, um, which didn't pay for the aluminum wall. And we said, well, what are we going to do? Let's uh, conceptually think about it as a kind of a dipped facade. So the cheapest thing we could possibly think of was stucco. So we said, what if we uh, do something for the Future Systems building, the self just department store, which is like an e climb blue uh, stucco on the last air coating, except just take all the discs off and make it rectangular, another 28 bucks a square foot. So the client, however, um, Mr. Wiley, uh, was not that enamored of a kind of a dipped, continuous surface facade, even though we thought it was super cool. Um, and basically, it kind of uh, they said something about it, it uh, didn't conform to their sense of permanence, which is in and of itself obviously a highly aestheticized kind of question because whether it be stone cladding, composite cladding, cladding, or brick cladding, whatever you want to call it, it's all about then, you know, kind of uh, the semi autonomous associations of certain materials to do with permanence or not permanence, which is in our world completely. Really uh, important, but also irrelevant to the way it's built. Because in the end, the way it's going to be built, no matter what we skin this thing with, is metal studs, dense glass sheeting, air water barrier, outboard insulation, and then material X. The question is, is what is material X? Material X also has a couple of roles, which is important. Material X, in this case, should not be permeable, so we provide UV protection and rainwater protection to the substrate in order to extend its life into something 50 or 100 years. That's a good thing. So rain screens in that regard are the right way to build. But now, what does it look like? Um, so this created a kind of a crisis. I and mean, the crisis was derived largely from cost. And uh, we were working on the new museum at the time, the stage of this office. And anyone can identify, of course, the metal uh, screen on the outside. But what's behind the metal screen is uh, four inch extruded clapboard siding custom extrusions. But they all just kind of interlock together to form a very, very cheap, optically active surface. It's a very neutral surface, but it has a small, subtle texture to it, without which the metal screen inside wouldn't really operate the same way it's operating. So when you uh, think about that surface, um, we said, well, what if we uh, conceptually take a clockwork side extrusion and just start engineering it three dimensions so it can span vertically? And we're like, okay, let's just start playing the extrusions, because if you have enough material, you can do whatever you want. So we started, well, um, our, my friend Ara is uh, Ella and his team uh, threw a whole bunch of acrylic tubes on the side of some silver car, and this model was born, and it was just so beautiful without any kind of rationalization to it, because it's doing whatever it needed to do. That we said, yeah, that's great. So we developed a kind of a model based on that, um, presented it to the client, and they just loved it. They didn't care at that moment about permanence, they cared about it being cool beautiful uh, from a very kind of essential standpoint. Now, some ideas from this evolved in very interesting ways. The idea of hanging the extrusions 90 feet vertically in a single run, uh, because, well, let, let me step back on second. The obsession with ideas of destroying uh, scale legibility still existed. So the idea of this kind of dip the side of its continuous surface, like true continuous surface, um, now follow me here, would have only been possible if the metal studs behind the sheathing, which are concealed, are all suspended from the roof. Because the structure inside this building has all sorts of weird transfers and stuff, and every beam is moving differently, that if I had to hang all that stud work locally, wherever it was most convenient, and then I tried to put an elastomeric coating of stucco on the outside, the stucco would just rip itself apart because the building is moving all over the place. So the idea of hanging it all from the top to the metal studs then got translated to the exterior cladding as it evolved later. So this idea of these tubes, that we said, well, we can hang these tubes one from another into a continuous splice so that there's almost no legibility of the joints. Otherwise, you have movement joints everywhere. And that was kind of essential to maintaining this idea of continuity. Um, also, notice here the kind of faked out backing surface. So this is like a 
paper card model, but then we realized, of course, between the joints, you want it to also be curvilinear. This is like the most baroque thing you can ever do. But this is uh, pretty effective. So eventually we, um, we developed some drawings, uh, hypothetical drawings of what these extrusions might look like, and then we tried to optimize them. And basically, if you have a subframe, you're just spending a lot more money than you don't need. And the idea that these extrusions could be hung vertically, first of all, they're in tension, so their buckling is very uh, little. Uh, then you say, what is the optimal span for each one of those extrusions? And believe it or not, the kind of even though these are built out of multiple assemblies, the composite eye value of these groups of extrusions, uh, regardless of the diameter and the size, ends up being exactly the same, based on the tributary wind load that it's taken. Meaning, these guys all span exactly 16 feet under the window. So there's a whole series of horizontal rails, every 16 feet on the center, with no additional subframe. Now, our friend uh, Dante Martinez, who's a contractor in uh, Buenos Aires, he did fabrication for all this. Um, and he didn't have an installation partner, so um, the Dallas Center for the Performing Arts Foundation <coughs> called uh, uh, Bill Zaner, who was working across the street on the uh, foster job. And Bill Zaner, as you might know, normally doesn't get involved in jobs he doesn't make. But he thought it was so cool that he said, okay, I'll install it. And um, their first instinct was to analyze the installation of the subframes for efficiency on site. Um, then we pushed him, and we pushed him to consider analyzing it in, say, uh, a 1 2 width by 90 feet vertical dimension. Um, and then just hang it one at a time at the top of the full length of the building. And that's exactly what they did, because they said, okay, that makes economic sense. So this is in the workshop down in Buenos Aires. This is our horizontal rail. That's the only secondary structure there is for the facade. And you can see each one of these basically has a T-bolt on the back that kind of locks in. Uh, these are some early prototypes of transition elements. This is the first visual mock-up. And then this is the kind of uh, T-bolt connection that you can see onto the vertical rails slotted connection that allows these things to breathe vertically as the building structure actually moves up and down. So, for example, the water prism is going to be over here, the insulation is going to be in this cavity, and then this is a, just a, a mainstream cavity as we go out. So then the idea of the tubes, once it became real and accepted and exciting, every other consultant started crash landing on it. So two by four started engaging in different graphics and uh, identity standpoint, they started perforating all the tubes and putting signage and illumination in them. It became the kind of foil for perimeter lighting at the base of the whole system. Every time we had um, a large area of fenestration, for example here, uh, we used just a kind of very standard off-the-shelf window system. Uh, but then the louvers, uh, or the tube on the outside, we said, well, let's turn them into a brief soleil. So they would basically either drop out or they would transfer geometrically into an ellipse and then remorph into a tube. And all of these things formally were built off of the original kind of concept idea. Another thing that we really liked that happened was the idea that the found resultant surface, which is the consequence of the technical execution of the system, ended up becoming the interior architectural surface for all the terrace zones throughout the building. So you're now just looking here, for example, at the back of the aluminum screen as a kind of found resultant, which is kind of cool. So these are the kind of transitional shields that take us from the kind of cylindrical geometry upwards. Uh, glass wall is pretty interesting. I won't go into it uh, at all. Um, but it's basically um, uh, an STC50 uh, glass wall, which uh, has a 50 decibel reduction of about 1,000 hertz. Um, and we did originally, as you saw uh, um, earlier, there's an idea of opening up large, large areas of the facade. Uh, now, just so you don't think that we compromised so much, there was never any way on earth, uh, given the budget of the project, that we're going to open up half the wall of the building. It's just like untenable. You're talking about walls that are 27 feet tall, 30 feet wide. Now, technically, we could do it. We knew what it would cost, and it was just not viable. Um, and choreographically, one has to say, at what instances would you open it? Why do you want to open it? You know, is it to bring things in and out, or is it just to allow people during the intermission to fly them onto the plaza or do what they do? And in the end, um, there was a, a, a zone of the facade, 20 feet wide, 27 feet tall, that is, in fact, operable. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. This is a 10 foot by 27 foot wide steel frame central pivoting with an STC50 uh, acoustically rated glazing assembly on it. And in order to make this work, um, there's perimeter uh, pneumatic gaskets with a micro compressor that sits on the frame that when uh, the windows are closed and there's a, an event happening, uh, the compressors inflate the gaskets to guarantee the STC50 acoustic rating. Uh, and in their decompressed version, it's still sufficient to actually keep the rain out and to provide adequate air infiltration, but normally not the acoustic rating. And we tested all of this in uh, Illinois here at uh, one of the acoustic labs. And of course, the finished photos. And that's it for wild. So, wild is really this um, very simple thing. Know, very special cladding in the service of the theatrical event. And they achieved what they wanted to achieve from an IPSC standpoint. The building really in the Dallas landscape holds its own against every other building around it and gives the Dallas Theater Center really the identity that they wanted while still having a very kind of fairly rough industrial kind of building. Um, this is the Walker Art Center um, close by here in Minnesota. Uh, we worked with Prince Edward now for quite a few years on this job. Now, the, I'm not sure if many of you know, maybe you've seen books on it, but um, the folded metal facade here was a compromise. I'll show you the um, Originally, it was meant to be a tensile fabric facade, and in many ways it was a precursor for the annual stadium and the project stuff in the stadium and other um, projects that they eventually did with um, fabric enclosures to the buildings. And this is one of it's one of the world's earliest models. Um, uh, Christine Binswanger was the partner in charge, and they were dealing a lot with ideas of folded paper, cutting, and if you've been to the building, you see all the interior drywall in detail. It's all about the kind of dematerialization of edges and walls that collapse in the forms and so forth, and sort of play of um, surface on surface. Um, we lost a bit of that, but originally this is what it was, um, partly because of uh, a very unsuccessful mock-up. Uh, this mock-up was built in Switzerland um, poorly, I might add. The Swiss aren't perfect. Uh, the, the idea was to use the kind of large pre-panelization of fabric uh, as a cladding. So we could clad the entire surface of the studio box in four panels. Basically, we could wrap them around. And using the stitching hierarchy of ten tensioning them together and then welding the seams every four foot horizontally and the kind of push and pull of the uh, actual struts with these kind of acrylic discs to create this kind of undulating sort of uh, Gucci lamp type of structure. And then the whole thing was to be internally illuminated. Uh, and you can even see here the original uh, windows are still there, uh, which the fabric would then be pre-stressed and tension cut all the way around those apertures. So really this is not um, fabric as long-standing enclosure, it's really fabric as mainstream cladding. Um, and it did work. Uh, the, I'm pretty sure it would have been pretty successful eventually had we had managed to do more studies. Unfortunately, the um, then curator of the uh, Walker Art Center um, declared it looked like an archaeological site in Rome that had never been unwrapped. Which is a shame. But um, if you know the project, um, the, uh, um, the um, Shiloh Museum in Basel uh, uses, uh, in some areas of the facade, a kind of pressed, expanded metal mesh. And we had some experience using expanded metal mesh. So this kind of eventually morphed into um, further studies. The panels here that we're looking at are actually from the Shiloh and then it morphed into this kind of study, just basically taking stretch metal and beginning to kind of crimp it, deform it, and so forth. And then it was studied in terms of repeatable patterns, um, how you can take one mold, turn it sideways, and have it kind of link up geometrically with all the other sides, and then laser cut it around the perimeters, and then ultimately cut it out of an anodized mesh. Um, and uh, this was made by uh, M.G. McGrath in Minnesota, who's a great uh, metal fabricator, put together a uh, uh, four foot by four foot steel press, and just basically sand these things. So it's a very affordable option at the end of the day um, for the walk to further. Now this is the real story. So you're talking about facades. 
primary structure is the white stuff behind, obviously. It's a secondary dirt system, which is just a wind load system to hang the panels for the facade. And then we have these uh, white prefabricated insulated panels from a company called Metal Span. Very, very affordable, low cost, barrier type system. Uh, where the panels go up, uh, joints get double caulked, and off we go. Our building is sealed. Now, each one of these points on the facade here is a small bracket connection that's thermally decoupled through the facade so that we can actually attach an exterior rail system that then holds the metal screen. Now, I'll point out to you, there's a difference between rain screens like the Wiley and screen screens uh, like Walker because this screen is open by a mesh which is completely permeable. You know, rain can go right through it, air goes right through it, and in there it's only there for aesthetic effect. And so we could actually stop moving the building at this point and it would perform largely to the same degree that it does right with the metal mesh on it. In case you're curious about how this gets done, um, the metal mesh panels here, of course, are completely open and permeable. The water's going right through them, and there's a zone in there of about 300 millimeters. So, what's holding this up? Basically, all of these windows have a huge steel structure that comes out like a gigantic bay window with steel gusset plates that go back on a diagonal in order to hold them in place. And then we basically brought waterproofing and insulation around to a very, very fine point, which then the glass is structurally glazed to a steel frame, and the metal mesh terminates right at that corner. So it actually bevels back on itself, and the water can all come back through down and over the glass. So they're just very large, glorified, very carefully built bay windows. It's quite an interesting glass wall as well, but I don't think we're going to go through that. Um, okay, so another project based on uh, huge amounts of kind of aesthetic consideration. This is the uh, 111th Avenue project by John Duval. And this building is interesting for me from uh, an occupant standpoint. Now, most people generally assume, maybe, I'm not sure, most people, most architects, that the facade patterning here is somehow algorithmically generated, somehow mathematically generated, that like it's scripted in some way. But Nouvelle is not that company. They're not doing that kind of stuff. They're not really interested in that. And it, it is actually derived from a much more kind of uh, base kind of level of concern that this building is divided into two facades. There's an expensive facade and there's a cheap facade. Sixty percent of the entire surface area of this building is brick, which faces on to the kind of Chelsea side and the warehouse side of New York, even who sits adjoining to a Williams prison, which is right next to the building. And on the other side, it's all about the kind of iconic presence of the building, but also the views. So the floor slab is basically organized in a way where all of the units basically go from front to back. And there's only um, ever seven, uh, let's see, rooms, not even seven apartments, sometimes only one apartment, sometimes there's two, sometimes three. Uh, but the index of your internal experience was the demising wall between your room. So if you walk into your apartment and you have a 37-foot room, I want a 37 foot composition from the interior on my facade. Now that's very rare, and it's based on a kind of a rejection of the terror of constructability limits of normal curtain walls. So everyone will say, well, if I'm going to ship a curtain wall, it's got to be a maximum of six feet wide, it's got to be a maximum of weight, it's got to be a maximum of whatever, it's going to be delivered from the floor, it's going to have all these kind of logistical constraints. So you're going to get a you know, a series of unitized panels, which obviously is logistically the most economical way of building um, a curtain wall in a tight kind of urban area. And that's true. So this curtain wall is more expensive than that baseline, clearly. Um, but the brick wall at the back is partly going to have to pay for the preview. So this kind of, this is a development project, and there's a very clear understanding at the outset that certain kind of key parameters have to be made and understood. But this idea of composing the facade from the interior is what drove this entire job. So the smallest panel is about 15 feet wide, the largest one is about 37 feet wide. 
and 37 feet wide was actually limited based on what we could put in a 40 foot container to ship it from China. Uh, in terms of the um, cost of the facade, there was only one way to procure it, which was to do large scale prefabrication on the ground in China uh, due to low labor costs, to send it by open top container. And then, believe it or not, for this kind of square footage of panel, the most economically affordable way is to do union based crane installed deployment of these facility units. So that's exactly how the project played out. Um, what you're looking at here is Jean Nouvelle's uh, uh, map of the direction of rotation, the materiality, and the angle of rotation. So even though there's three different glasses that are used in this, and they're all used in different angles, from the interior, it's actually very calm. There's almost no legibility of that. And in order to rationalize this for construction, you can see there is a kind of dominant regulating grid. The floor grids are regulated, and the vertical grids are regulated. Now, for residential construction, you've got to regulate the horizontals because you need fire safety, you need closures, you need acoustic separations between your apartments. That's safe for commercial construction. You just can't go from the floor. Whereas, say, with long span grids and so forth, you can do any kind of tessellation or optimization you want. But as soon as you start doing certain geometries, what we call water lining them, where you have to have a construction index, every plate, it changes the way you think about things. So the building resistance. this. He said, yeah, I understand. It's no problem. Let's do that. And then the, limit, the, the floor heights were limited. They're still pretty high, 11 and 12 feet. But they're limited so that we can guarantee that we can truck these things underneath all the bridges from the port of Elizabeth, New Jersey, to the site on the West Side Highway in New York. Now, the subdivision of all these had some informative. There are certain kind of panel typologies that were repeatable. Uh, but the interesting thing is once you start incorporating certain kind of offsets or operable windows or fresh air requirements and all the other kind of things that you need to overlay onto the facade requirements, there's almost absolutely no uniformity in the actual panels. So it's completely handmade. And I think um, at most there are three mega panels that are the same on the whole project at any given time. So what we're looking at here is the first, uh, this is a, started quite a long time ago, but it started to get us thinking about how to uh, parametrically control uh, facades that were not um, digitally generated in their first instance. So we start with kind of like the hand composition of the wireframe, and we start building a kind of uh, family of components, we start hanging them digitally onto the wireframe in a kind of uh, semi-automated way, and we begin extracting the kind of uh, resulting geometry of solids. Um, and this is very early, you'll see later on we get a bit more advanced. Uh, so this is the first visual model that was built out of the uh, model by a contractor who eventually did not win the contract. Uh, I'm racing right ahead here to full production panels on the street, just to give you a sense of scale of these prefabricated units. Now the moral of the story here is, uh, this isn't the easiest way to do anything, but it is a very specific engineered construction and aesthetic logic in the service of an architectural idea. And you'll see in kind of like the body of a lot of our work that we go to quite a lot of trouble, sometimes seemingly unnecessarily, but to satisfy certain things that are subtle but somehow profoundly important to the achievement of um, a certain kind of architectural design, you know, desires. So here's pre-panelized mega panels going up on the building. Quick interior shots. This kind of kind of collapsing three-dimensionally the surface into these metal plates that catch the light, very intentional. It's kind of like one of the kind of dominant ideas about how this thing, as it turns the corner, becomes two different kind of uh, visual effects. Okay, another project. Um, this is the Al Raha Sky Tower. Uh, done with Hanarishi and Design Couture of Asimtur. Uh, this job, unfortunately, has not been built. Uh, it got constructed up until the ground level, uh, so they were going to build it. And this is a very challenging project, and I'm just going to speak more about um, geometry here. This is like you're taking Lakeshore Towers and Plan, and you're taking Swiss Re in section, and you're taking Malmo and twisting it through 70 degrees. And that hybrid set of operations yields this generative geometry. Now, you take the design surface of that geometry, and all of you know this, you touch any point of it, 
and you're touching something that is curving in three axes at that particular point. And the nature of that curve at that point is unique to that surface. It's actually not really repeatable. Um, and begins to morph out in different ways. Now, when we look at how to build this, this is very important. We think, okay, well, we can do the uh, interactive corp strategy where we take quadrilateral panels, fit to their geometry, and we cold form the edges, and we bend it in to create this kind of smooth and smooth surface. Well, on the beginning, that's what the assumption was. As it turns out, the degree of twist and the degree of sectional variation created limits that we couldn't achieve. So we were basically talking about bending glass in about eight inches. And we know full well in the industry, we can do all of our analysis in terms of what glass can to stay for cold forming. And I, I'll point out to you, even before IAC, um, you probably may not know this, but four massively large surfaces of the Seattle Library are all twisted. They're actually ruled surfaces. They're all curved. And if you go up to the building very closely, you can start seeing certain things happen. And if you're wondering why that happens, it's because the books box is actually a parallelogram, and the box above and the box below it are perfectly rectangular. And if you connect those four points, you get a twisted surface. You set the steel in there, you get one line of directions and straight lines, the others are all curved. So about 20% of all the glass in Seattle Library is actually cold bent into its geometry by about three eighths of an inch. Uh, that's easily done. IAC in New York is quite a bit more, but still within certain limits. This was not achievable. And we unwrapped the building, we untwisted the building to the point where it worked. And we looked at that, and it was hideous. We said, we're not going to build that. We're not going to build that geometry just to satisfy some sort of fetish for cold forming glass. It's not what we're about. So, the next question was like, okay, well, do we try and get the entire surface? That's an obvious one. You can easily try and get the whole building. And do you really want to try and get this building? And he's like, forget it. I'm not going to try and get the building. Why? Because of some referential relationship to probably where that people are doing. Um, culturally, why that is, don't ask, but I think also experientially on the inside, they didn't want to try and get the the other thing I'd point out about cold forming glass, on the Seattle Library, who cares? On IAC, it's an office building. In terms of your domestic residential experience, do you really want glass that's been twisted and bent out of place? So in the evening, you're looking at reflections of yourself and you're basically deformed and twisted. You know, some of them might make you look thinner, the other ones are going to make you look grotesque. So triangulation is out, and cold forming is out. And this, this is in. This is taking Toledo Museum and stacking it 43 floors. Continuous surface of curved vertical glass, starting its life as a rectangular pounds, which generates this geometry. Now this is a constructional logic, experiential logic, rationalization of the pure design surface. Now, Heine didn't want to build this, Lee Zen didn't want to build this. Um, but what we did want was the kind of abstracted surface, the kind of filigree signature of the skin on the building, which originally was maybe some kind of a frit, um, as we build in our time in 23, and I'm not against the metal representation of structure of the frit. Um, but this becomes uh, real, because in Abu Dhabi, the building, an all glass building, is just about a dumb thing to do. So building an all glass building that has a 100% coverage with the Lee is a very smart thing to do. So we have then the development of an exoskeleton and the louvers that go on the exoskeleton and the glass sandwiching into now a kind of complex geometry, a complex interchange between systems. And what is interesting for us is that the design definition of the louvers and the design surfacing of the steel on the exoskeleton is the true geometrical representation of the original twisted design surface. So that original generative design surface is not lost. It's actually still present in this much more kind of complex filigree structure, which is then being built out of line elements as a tracery, as opposed to being built out of surface elements like glass, where we have a lot of problematic aspects. And then the glass behind it, of course, is rationalized. And even though every floor plate is different, that actually is a huge advantage because now we can rationalize 
every floor plate to three radiuses, and we can actually do integer optimization of the fixed length of every panel on the floor. So even though the radius is very, the actual fixed length of the glass is the same for every floor panel. So there's a high level of repetition, even though you're paying the premium for curved glass. So the question is, is like, what are you going to standardize? What are you going to customize? And then the section looks a bit like that. And then we have a facade access system, which uh, rolls in and around here. Basically, you can travel around the floors and ride up and down, which is pretty cool. Um, traditional wind tunnel study images. Uh, this is a structural element uh, analysis for the uh, exoskeleton, which is not holding up the building. For everyone to be clear, this is not the primary building structure. This thing is supporting every two floors off the primary structure and has slip connections all the way through it as well. Now, the primary structure, even though the geometry is crazy, uh, Arab actually came up with something really sweet, which is that if you take the main core and you concentrically draw a line up on a curve, the columns are all raking but in a straight line, axially concentric to the core. Always like that. But you find that as those things go up on a certain geometry, the surface can actually twist in and out of those columns and navigate them and keep them all to the interior of the building structure. So there's no, even though the building looks like one of those buildings that actually wants to twist under kind of wind and gravity seismic, it doesn't. It's very stable. So then this is an image showing the analysis of the Hoover infill. And now we worked also with the Tilly 10 and environmental guys uh, uh, very closely on this and many other projects. But they, uh, of course, it was kind of an obvious thing to do, was to geometrically optimize the depth of the louvers in the plan based on building orientation. Uh, and that was done. So the, pit, the vertical pitch is always the same, 750 millimeters. But the depth goes down to about 250 millimeters all the way up to 750 millimeters in order to actually cut it to some, but preserve the views of the building. And then we get into the kind of steel optimization. So this got all the way down to the full construction documents, uh, pretty far along. Uh, we also did a lot of work with the TIA on this um, job. Uh, we were modeling uh, parts and assemblies, and their technologies was on board to do kind of larger information model management. And I would point out, I'm not sure if uh, Honey's Designers from the school here to talk, but, but they've, uh, they've engaged in, as they've begun to build, they've engaged in the kind of rigors of technology and optimization in a fairly kind of direct and open way, uh, which is really a testimony to, I think, where the practice is going. It's, uh, their ability now to deliver is far, far beyond the kind of conceptual basis. I mean, you'll see that at the very end of this talk. So here's some quick ATM models basically showing uh, catalog of parts, which then fully instantiated across the whole building. Now, this model here was not done on the tractor side. This is a design basis model, where, of course, you know, the tractors and the quantity surveyors as well have no way to actually now deliver quantities of information. So this is, you know, pulling back onto the architectural design team to now start delivering specifics and to deliver this kind of geometric optimization and to provide all that information to the side contractors and the general contractors as to what they can this is our overall liability, uh, but uh, essentially necessary to move the process forward. So this is as far as we got, and they mocked all the job. So something's going to get built on those foundations. Uh, they need this. This is um, the Lincoln Square Synagogue. This project is currently under construction in New York City. It's at Amsterdam 67. It's for an Orthodox school. Uh, the facade. Um, I think in its final iteration will not be so much legible in terms of metaphor, but that makes its imagination. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that. Uh, nonetheless, it's a um, metaphor for five scrolls in the Torah. And formally, though, it's, it's quite um, interesting. And the architect is uh, Seth Rudy, who are more known for um, kind of speculative developer work. But John Seth managed to win this. Um, Mission through competition, and uh, hats off to him. And then he uh, had a lady named Teresa Genovese from the GSD come in and basically run it. And it's to her uh, uh, credit that we have taken on the role that we have on this job. Now, to jump straight forward, this was um, being designed around 2006, 2007. And 
when this facade was uh, conceived in its current iteration, this could only be built by the best vertically integrated facade contractors. Okay, you don't know what that means. It just means people that design, wear, supply, and install, right? So they can own their own design and they can do custom work from the ground up. Because most mom and pop contractors don't have the design ability or the modeling capability to actually describe, let alone control, the logistics of a facade like this. And it's not that big, it's only about 6,000 square feet, but it's complex, it's very complex. Um, so, Companies like Sealy and Gartner, uh, WW, the kind of best New York contractors, or well, German-based New York contractors, who are uh, capable of doing this, we're talking about $700, $800 a square foot. I know that's not cheap by anyone's stretch, but it's about a square foot over the surface area of the wall. Uh, and that was far beyond the owner's budget. Now, the owner didn't have a low budget. I mean, our number $350 a square foot to build this thing. Uh, but we were confronted with the reality of saying, well, do we give this up? Because clearly, the market could not give us this facade for the budget the client had. So it's about then further rationalization, further design. And it's one thing if you're 15 or 20%, you, know, you can have a tire kicking or arm twisting, do whatever you want to try and get uh, the value. But when you're 100% of it, no. It's time to like roll it up, redo it, do something else. But we said, let us look at the fundamental pricing of this thing because if it's all made out of aluminum, we don't actually think it's that expensive. Uh, and they said, okay, we'll give it a try. And we came back and we said, we think we can do it. We think we can do it for that budget. And they said, okay, well, uh, you have the kind of like, right to it. Why should we trust you? I mean, this is a, uh, uh, a synagogue that has um, a steering committee, a board, and accountability, and they. Um, uh, they need to be able to say to people who are donating money that uh, this group of people are bona fide and are able to deliver that. So we started that process. We went through endless numbers of presentations, presenting our work, presenting how the industry works, presenting why we could make a difference when the market couldn't make a difference. And this isn't a fantasy, it's not an answer for every job. But there's a specific set of circumstances here that we felt we could handle. So, they eventually agreed, and we made a contract, and it's a very Zen-like contract, a very unusual contract. There's mutual hold harmless clauses, there's mutual indemnification clauses, there's no liquidated damages, no consequential damages, and no one's allowed to go to court. So, um, basically, oh, also, there's no guarantee in schedule. So, essentially, they're treating us like an artist. They're just saying, even that. Okay, we trust you to do it. We know it's got to stand up to win and it's got to satisfy current requirements and all that jazz. The other thing that we're interested in doing is using um, fabric in the glass uh, in order to push this metaphor even further. And also optically, it's quite different from using frit or paint or any other kind of device in between glass because of more kind of like a non standard, natural way the material is being deployed. <coughs> And uh, we agreed with them uh, because I've been trying to do the animated fabric for quite a while. I've been trying to send to the television, might have been an animated fabric, but it's too risky for a lot of people uh, because there's not a lot of precedence. But we said to the client, we said, okay, we're going to do two things. We're going to, you, you agree contractually that we can do ceramic silk screen onto the glass and the architect will generate patterns with us and we'll all live with that if that's what we have added. But at the same time, within our budget, we will fund the R&D development of a man-made fabric product um, to the point where we're willing to warranty it and uh, DuPont will stand by it and our glass fabricator will also warranty it as well. And that's a pretty long shot, short of this focus, that we succeeded, we did that. Now, so this is an interesting project that for me combines a uh, kind of synthesis between a hyper-digital process and management. Um, of the information, and also a, a very kind of artisanal analog process in terms of the materiality. Uh, and there's a few other projects in this mix that kind of show that. So, one thing that you're doing, I think you kind of caught on to the rhythm of this, there's always questions at the outset saying, what are you going to optimize? What are you going to try and unify as a penalty for something else that all hell breaks loose in terms of 
want? What can you manage? In this case, the aesthetic continuity of the glass was most important. We didn't want to use curved glass, we actually wanted to render the curves in 16 inch pieces of glass all the way along. And we wanted the joints between the glass up here to be exactly three quarters of an inch. Always, regardless of what the pattern was. So that means when you do an offset to the interior, everything changes. The glass starts sliding in and out uh, relative to the volume, the volume angles, the transom angles all change, all of that changes. So there's kind of like maximum condition, the medium condition, the minimum condition. So mapping out those maximums is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we start basically building the logic. So jumping into this, one thing that's very peculiar, I'm not sure if you guys have the same experience as I do, but when you rationalize something into radial arcs, the inflection point between radial arcs is legible. It's a strange thing. So you have an arc like this, and then you have a point of inflection into a different radius and another radius, and you start reading it in some sort of facet. There's like a kink visually that shows up there. I know there's probably some sort of optical reason for that, but I am not sure what it is. But we did some digital mock-ups and we said it's not looking good. So we kept to the idea of using some true splines. So along the spline curve, we have kind of fixed end dimensions that tie into the frame that we're trying to infill. And then we basically say we're going to do a, a fixed integer optimization again to basically hit exact panel dimensions. And then we're locking in the 16 inches because 15 inches, believe it or not, this gives us too long an aspect ratio that we could not fabricate it. And 17 inches gives us too coarse a dimension that aesthetically it looks like a box bracket. So 16 inches was a kind of sweet spot. And we knew that, and then we said, now let's optimize the geometry for that dimension. So this is basically on exactly 16 inch dimensions that all have a three quarter inch result for the geometry. And then we, we took some freehand curves from Teresa started to compare them against the optimized spines, and this is the kind of comparisons that we've got. Now, this generates the wireframe, and of course you get superimposed curvatures relating to each other, and in some cases you have sockets, and in other cases you have skylights. And when you see these three zones here, these are all skylight areas. And of course, the skylight at one end is perfectly flat, the other end is perfectly flat from aesthetic continuity, which means that the angle of every perlet is only different angle, which means all the glass is twisted. So the skylights on these particular elements are all cold formed as well, just like the one in Seattle. So now we're using tools like that, just like this little thing in the back pocket to solve some problems as we come across them. But it's not really about that. What I like about this drawing here is completely utterly useless. <laughs> the only thing this drawing is good for is uh, my friends at the Center for Architecture decided to incorporate that drawing in their new exhibition at, on curtain walls. Because it's the only drawing that is, you know, legible, but not verifiable. So if I gave you that drawing and you started looking at all these coordinate points relative to these x, y, would you know what any of that meant, or would you be able to check it? And if I gave you the idea model, would you be able to go and interrogate every point and verify for me that it's correct? No. So at a certain point, this drawing was generated to fulfill a contractual obligation for us now as a contractor to send it to the construction manager for record. But the construction manager couldn't check me. No one's checking this stuff. They're saying, it's all on me, man. You do it. So we made a few of these, but they're quite tricky. Uh, and then there's these sort of sectional diagrams that start showing how it works. Essentially, it's a window wall. It's not a curtain wall. And I would define curtain walls as uh, waterproofing and, code, and structural codependency between panels. Uh, this just has neither. Uh, this is a series of drawings that are the kind of geometrical work point set out to lock down the generative geometry of the whole facade. And this was contractually binding. So this was a very important drawing because Teresa was able to check that. And then we get into Kitia. So this is our wireframe. And then the wireframe we start building up again our kind of uh, a family of components and parts. And the model just evolves over time to become more and more complex. So things like this, for example, of course, the glass thickness is modeled. The interlayer thickness is modeled. The edge beveling arising on the glass is modeled. The edge spacers are modeled. The silicone is modeled. Why? Because it's a parametric template. As soon as you know what a real piece of glass looks like, you just model it once and then basically drive it and instantiate it into your uh, system. 
So then it, uh, you've just seen now about eight months of development, uh, don't here. And this whole model is developed at this kind of level of resolution. So the actual extrusions which are fully engineered have been captured as a kind of family of components. There's master parts which don't change, and then there's uh, variable parts which have adaptive parametrics which change when they get instantiated into a significant line element and their family uh, gets kind of known. Uh, this is our kind of still assemblies here, but let me jump ahead to uh, this. So this is one logical sub-assembly which if we then instantiate this set of components at one time, uh, we want to create a sub-assembly drawing for this. So in Katia, what we're doing is we're using document templates, which are simply programmed uh, 2D templates, which automatically are generated uh, as DWG and PDF files from the moment we instantiate something into the wireframe. So if we take one group of this and we dump it into the wireframe at that moment, it not only exists in the model, but also exists as a set of two files. And it also names all the part and explodes them all simultaneously into directories of the TFR files, which can each be individually factored. So this is kind of holding the rail and vertical integrating like curtain wall mass customization that we've been after, and it's taken us seven years. And there's a lot of reasons why it hasn't happened. Um, or I mean it's happened to certain degrees, lots of people are interested in like building MDF and doing all sorts of stuff. But to handle the kind of um, system complexity of multi-material, multi-geometry kind of curtain wall systems is really difficult and usually not worth it. Nobody wants to do it. We only did it not because it was economically advantageous. We did it because it was intellectually interesting. That's why we did it. Prince to Lisa, our friends, don't want to do this because they don't have a year of getting the job sitting with an architect to start building conceptual master model parts. They want to take the design in a set of drawings, and they might provide free construction services, but eventually, they don't have time to build these models. They might use Navis works for all sorts of like uh, data management, they might use uh, solid woods for kind of scripting, and they certain like uh, and, you know, there's lots of optimization that goes on, but not at this kind of like, totalizing kind of way, where you can actually eventually have one master model that theoretically has every single component so this drawing here again is just like a, you know, a sketch from you know, building materials. So we've got uh, structural modeling, and we first started doing prototypes of the material here. Uh, there's not too many materials that you can laminate that will last, so it had to be synthetic or a metal. Uh, the metal fabrics we looked at been done in a lot of ways, and the GPU meshes and all that, but we weren't really interested in that aesthetic. We're interested in something where the filaments were so fine they couldn't be painted couldn't begin to film at that time. And we sought out um, a family of materials, which is the material raw material is Trivira, which is a fairly common um, synthetic fabric material. Uh, but the manufacturer for this is a company in France called the Creation Metaphor, uh, who have uh, very secret um, weaving equipment, which they won't show us. Uh, and that company is a subsidiary of that And so they make all the areas of scars and custom fabrics and all that. So essentially we have an Hermes scarf as our facade. So we worked with them to create a kind of bronzy Trivira synthetic. And then we started taking it um, uh, into laminated glass samples and we started testing it. And we did oil tests, bait tests, we did uh, accelerated UV tests, we did shear flexure, uh, all sorts of tests, basically we beat the hell out of it. So we did this in collaboration with advice from Japan saying, what is the most relentless testing protocol that you can throw on this stuff? Now, we've been doing lots of testing on this before, but... Anyway, so, um, now down to some of the milling. Uh, this is in our workshop in Brooklyn. One thing this project did is it catalyzed us to basically set up a little uh, machine shop, um, which we're now merging into our office space uh, next week in Brooklyn. And so the fixed rate we're looking at here is based on us milling all of these little 16-inch transoms all the little 16 inch aluminum extrusions that go between the lines in every bay. And every bay has a series of unique extrusions, so there's several thousand unique parts that have incrementally variable end cuts and center load cuts. And so we designed our own fixtures with our own clamping systems in order to hold the actual final extrusions 
and then you know, took everything directly from the TIA model into Excel spreadsheets, from Excel spreadsheets to drive feature cam, and they use feature cam to basically automate the sequencing of like-minded groups of five different extrusions, and then we put the extrusions in, we probe the ends of each one of them, and then the macros basically goes through and mills all the pieces, take them out, we label them, and we stick them on the shelf. So the milling action part was pretty fast, but we didn't find too many, uh, frankly, any manufacturers on the aluminum side who were willing to do this level of work, which was interesting because we didn't know that when we tried to do it ourselves, because it's too onerous, um, it's too slow, it gets too expensive, and the level of precision required, uh, they didn't want to take that kind of responsibility. So this is kind of one typical transfer and there's several thousand parts like this that are all unique. So we build our own uh, little prototype in the workshop, and milling of all these components. What you're looking at here is that's the kind of shadow box assembly. This is the horizontal transom. There's a, a milled uh, white acrylic lens that goes in here with the LED lights below. It basically shoot through the floor up onto the glass, and the glass is continuous across the transom. So that's the lens. It's like a perfect fit. Everyone is different as well. And then we basically start putting the fabric in, looking at it during the day, looking at it during the night. And so every single band, all 250 bands in the facade have a 12 inch LED at the top and the bottom, which are then all angled exactly to eliminate uh, a surface of ceramic thread on the back to provide a luminous backdrop to the actual fabric itself. So right now the steel's up, um, our secondary steel's being installed, we're assembling all of the extrusions right now, all the glass is fabricated, all the long extrusions are sitting in Mexico, all the secondary steel is sitting in Montreal, and we're ready to finish the job. So that has um, really transformed our business, it's the kind of uh, ability to deliver that. Now, on the complete polar end of this, um, we, we accidentally, not accidentally, but we happenstance was, um, were contacted by an old friend of mine who used to be a, a project architect at KPF, and he then uh, became a regional design director at uh, Louis Vuitton in Paris. And he um, was going to, they have a large architectural office, and then for all of LV's specialty work, they hire exterior consultants, like, Jim Aoki or Peter Lee or Peter Moreno or various other people that they've worked with over the years um, to do their stuff. <clears throat> but um, my friend Carr uh, hung me back after like six years I hadn't spoken to him. He uh, had this idea that maybe we should um, design this instead of just consulting on it. Uh, so he asked us if we'd be willing to do an invited competition for LV uh, against and Peter Lee and a few other people. Uh, and we won. So we we took an approach. Now this is quite challenging because it's it's not again it's, well it's about a seven thousand square foot facade in Singapore at the corner of Orchard and Scott Road, which is a pretty high profile. Obviously it's not a whole building; it's just a, a retail facade on the uh, main street. But when we looked at um, the kind of traditional LED work, which was all based on kind of superimposed graphic devices, we were very interested in saying, well. You know, the LV brand is an interesting one. It goes all the way back to the 1860s. They have four color motifs, and of course, it is a certain kind of uh, uh, reputation for quality and craftsmanship. So we were interested to say, well, we want the actual material uh, through, without kind of graphic treatments, without kind of um, uh, you know composed representations through. Uh, paint, or through printed into layers, or through patterning of glass in a way. Uh, we wanted something that was just much more visceral uh, as an experience, and something that was much more kind of ambiguous in its identity and the way it would change. So this is where um, we settled on a few kind of assumptions. One, that we would use uh, low iron glass as a baseline material that we would curve that glass, that we would texture that glass, and that glass surface through those manipulations would become the design. 
And so this is really a crop process about manipulating a certain material in a certain way. And then, of course, we have to come up with the rest of the other stuff, the structure, identity, and all those things. Now, the first part of this, which is curving the glass, big deal. So, do it all the time. In this case, though, uh, what we wanted to do is kind of a, from a, um, almost like an uh, anthropomorphic kind of scale issue, is to develop a, develop like a, an enlarged developed surface area of the skin of the least line in order to uh, have a different kind of physical reading between the users and the actual facade itself. So there's a certain scale of manipulation where people can actually start physically being engulfed by the skin and where the kind of texture of the material and the way it kind of relates to you changes, uh, you know, whether you're looking at it as kind of a large uh, linen-like surface or whether you're beginning to go out and actually engage it and touch it. So right from the outset, we knew that we would um, have a fixed length but when we did the kind of curved, developed surface area, we knew that that would eventually uh, be manipulated. We knew that they had to have the the mechanisms, and the structures, and there's some obstructions, all sorts of things that you have to handle. So a parametric model was basically the only way to kind of handle that. And what we did was we said, um, we knew that we wanted the developed length of each individual piece of glass to be exactly 990 millimeters. Uh, at the competition stage, we knew Fusion Glass out of the UK was the only company that had a combination of industrial and artisanal capability. And so when we put our competition entry in, we said Fusion Glass has to produce the glass. In the end, Fusion Glass actually didn't produce the glass. They were vetted and our assumptions were proven incorrect. Now, if we didn't know who they were, what they were capable of, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We would have spent six months just trying to figure it out. So being able to deliver a facade from concept design to completion in 12 months, You'd have to know who you want to play with at the outset. You have to know how to engage in this year. So this is one of the advantages we do have, and this is where our client speculating that that might be the case and that actually being correct. So this plan basically manages to be divided into seven distinct groupings, wherein we can parametrically manipulate again this kind of fixed integer optimization along the length, so that the slump curve length of each individual piece of glass is always the same. And it was our way of trying to create a kind of stock sheet of slumped glass. I'll explain to you what that means in a second. So each one of these individual pieces would have initially a texture from the sand casting. So we basically have a sand bed, we draw lines in it, we put it on, and this is one of our glass technique, you roll it into the oven, the glass softens into the mold, and you move part of it with that. Now, because glass that's textured like that and um, curved cannot be tempered, you must laminate it. If you're going to laminate two sheets of glass like that, you'll know that the surface undulations and the deformations of one sheet is not going to be the same as the second sheet. So you now have to slump two matching pieces of glass together in the same mold with the least agent in between. Fusion glass knows this. So we put it into the slumping oven, each pair comes out, they get released, and then they get offset by around three millimeters, and then we do uh, an acrylic resin with a uh, suction based uh, set. Um, you can also do a, a urethane resin, uh, but the acrylic resins have better uh, whiteness, which is what we're interested in. So that was when we laminate this glass. We couldn't use a uh, PBB or a sheet type laminate, which is also one of the things that we knew. So we have uh, now uh, slump texture, laminated, low iron, custom curved glass. And this is why we wanted the, the basic slumping glass to be the same width. And then basically the dimension from there to there is 990 millimeters. The dimension from there around here is the same. Now, as the wind acts on this structure, what is the normal axis if the whole thing is curved? So structurally, we end up with the most slender section. We end up with a circular mullion. And the mullion is then suspended in order to prevent torsion buffer. So we have an 11 meter long mullion that's only about this wide. Every point. And then, since I'm Hans Holland fan, we decided to chrome it up. This is the um, various textures of lines in the glass. Structural analysis of the hung facade. Now, one thing, of course, we're very interested in was 
not having any transoms. We knew we had to have vertical sections. It's like, okay. Um, we didn't want to do a cable wall. So in the end, these things, this kind of rhythm that was really generated from the kind of digital offset of the pattern of the glass created its own kind of interior rhythm that we rather enjoyed. And then the entrances, these structures around the doors and the trees were all suspended from the mines as well. And now this is a little trick. Um, this is comes from the kind of structural glass world. Normally, conventional wisdom says you take a piece of glass to support it with the quarter points in order to reduce the stresses. But for lots of architectural reasons, we don't want to do that. We want to support the glass at the uh, corners. Now, this glass is annealed glass. It's rather unique. Um, and when you size up your setting blocks, you normally don't want to size annealed glass on the corner supports because the stresses that result tend to crack and fracture the glass. So we had to engineer an enlarged setting block that was curved to the glass geometry. And so these kind of steel seats get welded to the face of the mullion. And this geometry is unique for each pair of glass that's actually coming off of it. We did this also in the block The reason to do this is so that the glass is spanning horizontally with no frame and just has a silicone tone. So from the interior, it looks continuous and smooth. So this is the uh, facade design, the commission model from Radii for the uh, presentation to the brush lines. There's the slumping glass. So there's the lines we brought into the mold. That's the slumping oven. And then these are the initial samples. Now for this, we basically looked at like, you know, 50, 60 different line textures, different kind of levels of vitrification, revitrification, breaking the glass surface. Um, there's so many different kind of subtleties to this. But uh, fusion glass is pretty good. So we're very interested in the kind of uh, long, uh, glancing kind of lights, metal halide lights at the top that illuminate the lines on the glass surface. So this is the first technical mock-up we did for lighting at um, Fusion's back in London. And then we went on to build, uh, even within this compressed time frame, and at the seven-month stage, at 12 months, a full-scale prototype in southern China. So the garden was our original contractor. Um, very good. And this is a five foot by eleven meter, sorry, five meter by eleven meter uh, uh, prototype mock-up. Basically, where we're starting to study the overall effects and how this thing would actually perform. So the, the, the kind of story here is, apart from geometry and optimization, all that stuff. What we are interested in here, I have to say, is simply about the visual and haptic experience of the material itself under very funny conditions. It's very similar to the Lincoln Square Synagogue job in terms of its kind of core concerns. And the way this thing operates, sorry, this is sideways, but there's certain images I've shown uh, to people, they just said, is that, is that concrete? Is that, you know, the, the ambiguity in terms of what material this is, I think is one of the most kind of compelling aspects. And we all know glass is like infinitely kind of variable. Um, but it's difficult. Uh, I mean, Jamie Carpenter is like one of our kind of heroes and mentors, but his ability to kind of endlessly pursue variants on uh, the synthesis of optical effects and structures uh, actually was kind of a, um, you know, an inspiration for this particular uh, facade design. Although you can see in this, uh, the, uh, the geometry and the effects are somewhat more exuberant than Jamie lets himself do. So this is the kind of template laying out on the factory floor. some handbags. Anyone care to guess what this costs? Not as much as the Apple Q. We were disappointed by that. 
in case you're wondering, the developed surface area of the Apple Q in cost to install, 1400 US a square foot. So it's an $8 million Q, which of course the negotiator could take away and then lease This facade is 1200 US a square foot over the developed surface area of the facade. And um, of course, I'll be complained. Yes, they do exist. Uh, that it was very expensive. And they actually said it was the most expensive facade for square foot they ever built, which I figure if we're going to spend somebody's money, we should spend their money. <laughs> but we did our research, and they have um, scars that are kind of conceptually similar to this. Uh, and the cost per square foot of their scars is uh, the same as our facade. <laughs> They didn't appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, you get the picture. Uh, we, we, fortunately, um, I guess we did a good job, and uh, since then we won another competition for an affiliated company with uh, LB. Uh, we're now designing and engineering four new large facades in Asia, two in Hong Kong, and some of them in Honolulu. Pretty exciting for us to kind of take it to kind of next level. They're still not old buildings, but they're uh, somewhat more three dimensional. So, this is the uh, Toledo Museum, which, uh, I mean, Sageman talks about her work in a certain way, and I won't talk about it in that way. But the, the initial respect the poetic vision uh, is essential. To recognize that the sun is work, uh, a model, a rhetoric, a diagram, is not party, it's not an abstraction, it is actually the intention. And all I can say to you, perhaps, about that is that at a certain point, you need to suspend your disbelief. Because if you don't, you're going to self censor yourself before you can get to an answer that gets close to achieving that. Otherwise, you're going to cut yourself off early, uh, and you won't get to certain solutions that at first might seem uh, oblique, or they might seem, uh, how do you say, unreasonable. But in the end, Toledo engages a lot of that. Now, one thing I can say about Toledo is there's no coatings on the glass. A lot of snow. Uh, there's no frets. Uh, there's no insulated glass panels. Uh, there's a lot of nothing. Uh, now, the, the, nobody is naive on the whole team, on the client, on us, uh, about the true qualities of glass. We know that this glass is not neutral. We know that our decisions are not neutral. And even to say that we're going to use low iron and milled glass that's super flat and super optically clear, it still has very present material qualities. Right? It still has those qualities. And the building becomes all about the kind of respect and the manipulation of those qualities to effect. Now there's a lot of early decisions that can be made. Like, for example, doing these frameless glass walls that are two feet tall would be much easier with tempered glass. Now tempered glass is, oh, it's strong, it's better, right? Easier, safer. But tempered glass is not neutral. Tempered glass has a roller wave distortion from the tempering process. It has global warp issues. It has strain patterns, polarized iridescence in the body of the glass after it's been treated. I mean, you're basically taking the material and you're heating it up and then cooling it down at a controlled rate where the outside surfaces are contracting at a rate faster than the middle of the body of the glass. You're creating a post-tension yacht mass out of a thin plate of glass. And how could that be, how could that be pure after it's been manipulated? Certain interlayers are not color neutral. There's all these kind of subtleties um, in these kind of questions. So the flatness of the glass was also not just an aesthetic requirement. For example, if I have two sheets of 13-foot glass, and I install them, and they're tempered, and there's a global work problem, and one panel is one-eighth inch in that direction, the other one's one-eighth inch in that direction, and the 
middle aisle, a quarter inch of this alignment on my two panels right in this midsection. What do you do? Nobody here has an answer because you're screwed. There's no way home at that point. Your glass is delivered to sight and it doesn't align. And you can't, you have no mechanism in this facade here, no mechanism at all to pull this into straightness. It's not like you can key it up and uh, let the stresses come out of it again. You have to rip it out and redo it. You have to keep kicking your glass manufacturer until he makes the tempered glass straight. And even at that, you know, you look at the rear window or the automobiles and you see that kind of strain pattern that shows up under certain lighting conditions. Just imagine 13 feet by 200 foot glass walls simultaneously manifesting an iridescence pattern. It's like, what the hell is that? So you, you, you've got to know this. Now, Sigma, you know, pure sense, really would have liked the whole thing to be a continuous band of glass. In fact, she didn't really care that it's glass. Couldn't be anything. Couldn't be cast acrylic. She's done this stuff. I keep saying she, but right? you know it's them, right? Um, so, in the end, it was glass. It had to be glass. And the height of the museum had to be 13 feet tall. And at a certain point, it was 15 feet. But it wasn't going to be lower than 13 feet for the ceiling. There's no chance. Now, uh, this is where we start getting kind of like education. Who here knows uh, the maximum width of fabricated glass on filter? Part of the professor. Well, it's slightly variable, but it's generally 3.2 meters to 3.3 meters. And if you add it up, 3.2 meters to 3.3 meters is less than 13 feet. Which means the vertical orientation of our glass panels is in this direction. Must be. We could not do huge landscape panels. Impossible if you're going to use glass. So at that moment, you say, okay, well, that means I'm going to have to join at least every 3.3 meter on the center. Now, it has to be laminated, right? So who's got the biggest autoclave? What's the dimensional limitation of an autoclave in order to laminate the glass together? Now we're up to about 10 foot, 10 foot 6, but at the time we're about 2.95 meters. Um, so that begins to set an index for the fabrication. Who can make the longest curved glass of that width? Only five companies in the world. Two in Italy, one in Spain, one in Finland, one in China. That's it. Recently there was a Wall Street Journal article on how you can get ready to the museum. You should Google it, it's pretty interesting. It's all about it, so it's in China. Um, but the, uh, the, the, uh, one of the American companies wrote a retort basically saying, uh, it was not a technical issue why this glass got sent to China. It was a cost issue. Well, sure, it was a cost issue. But the actual reality given with that particular company was that they said, uh, we can't make it, but if you fund our investment in a larger uh, article, then we can. So at that point, it's a financial issue, not a technical issue. Whereas many people, like we're dealing with Reynolds right now in Colorado for a John Bell project that uses Jumbo and Crow. Uh, and these guys are like, yeah, sure, we'll just build another outlet for it. And we'll try to expand our business to deal with it. I guess they have bigger lines of clients. You know, in the end, uh, industry is either ready or they will get ready. One or the other, but can't yeah, both this. Uh, this is the structure by Dean Ordinson. Uh, there's too much to talk about here, so I'm going to go through it. Scale of the glass. So you can see how perfect it is. Uh, one thing I just want to mention is the joint. The joint. The joint is this kind of issue that to deal with on every project because it is the inevitable resultant of all of your compromises. You have to deal with scale. And I tell you, like every conventional curtain wall in the world that merges at about four feet wide by five feet wide by eight feet to twelve feet tall. And the reason is because uh, aluminum frames are uh, efficient for weight at that index. Glass spans are efficient for spanning at that index. And you go wider, you're spending more money on thickness. You're spending uh, smaller, you're spending more money on metal. In the end, there are true uh, physical metrics where uh, things are most economical. And that drives commodity curtain wall around the world. Now, commodity curtain wall is great. I'm glad we have it. Because now we can do uh, standard storefront systems for like 68 bucks a square foot. 
and that's actually pretty nice. You know? Otherwise, we couldn't have that. Uh, but then, if you want to do something larger or wider or more difficult, then you start to understand what you're dealing with. So the joint becomes a very particular thing uh, because there is that kind of uh, thing that you intuitively recognize and begins to kind of break down all the ideas that you have. So the things that are, of course, broken down into such small tiles, say like uh, ceramic tile or spray on elastomeric coatings, becomes noteworthy because of its level of abstraction as a surface. Or things that have tile patterns that are uh, seemingly uneconomical are noteworthy because they aren't uneconomical and someone still paid for it. You know, there's some, you know, we culturally understand that, but we know you can't always kind of put your finger on it. Now, on Toledo, uh, I have a little subroutine here. The steel in Toledo is only a million bucks. The concrete in Toledo is two and a half million bucks worth of concrete. It's in the basement. It has a 14 foot gigantic basement with a huge loading dock and 40 foot spans in the basement. The key designed it very efficiently, but I'll tell you, 40 foot concrete creeps. So the edge of the building has a 14 foot concrete wall. It's stiff, really super stiff, on a raft. So when we put our exterior glass panels up there, we just have to stick them in a little extrusion and we're done. But on the middle, the middle of the whole building, the interior glass, you take that nine foot wide panel on two points and you actually translate the panel for the creep of the concrete over time, or even the rock load deflection. And you do have these areas in the building where you get like a hundred people standing in front of a hot shop. Uh, the concrete goes down. The other part of the concrete goes up. All of a sudden, your glass room. Anyone care to hazard under normal conditions how wide our glass joint had to be once it was finally designed? 40 millimeters. That wide. Theoretically, if designed for normal standards, every joint on the inside of the building would have that much gunk in it in order to actually have the joints. And when we actually size all that up, it you know, sound is just like, you know, just like, kill me now. So in the end, we're like, oh, uh, we're going to make it work. So how do you make it work? If you watch my hands here, if your panel is wacky this way because it's held on two points, the only way to make it not do that is to hook it on one point. To make the glass, brace it at the top, put it on a single point, and have the glass move like this. And then design your joint, not for expansion and contraction, but for vertical shear. So how do you hold a 9 foot by 13 foot sheet of glass on a single point? Well, you can't. If you like that, that really the top one I was talking about, if you put a setting block down there, the glass would just crack. It would just rip itself apart from the inverse reaction that's going back into the bottom of the glass. So, well, you can make a very, very big setting block. And then you take that setting block, you grout the glass to the bottom of that, so it's uniformly distributed. And then you machine the bottom of it so it looks like a banana. And it allows the load to resolve into a single point. So every single piece of glass on the inside has a machined steel banana to transfer the loads from the edge of the glass down to the steel and then axially to bring it back to a single point so the glass is basically only going to be That's called a rocker detail. This is also a really cool. Um, this is, uh, there was a desire uh, at one of the courtyards for a, um, a skylight to be perfectly flush with the surface of the courtyard for the conservation space below. Now, you can't take a 9 foot 6 piece of glass and put it flat because it's going to deflect under its own weight by about an inch in front of the water. And then, of course, the only way to drain that is to basically put it up on its edge, and then that piece of glass is still curving, and you get a little kind of triangular wedge on the side or a big upstanding way, you get the case. However, if you stop curve the glass in both directions into a contact lens, essentially a dome, essentially a dome, you can create a shallow structure. And that's what this section is. We did a skylight, nine foot six diameter, double laminated, insulated, bony coatings, continuously structurally laid on the perimeter with this kind of detail. Now, no one's done this before. And uh, we asked uh, our friends in Sanxin in China, could you make this? And they 
try. They fail several times. Eventually they succeed. And um, we brought this piece of glass to the site. Uh, these guys, they put it on airbags, and they drop it down into place. And so what's really nice about this is because it has this very gentle vibe, it's only about an inch and a half, it has no self-deflection at all. And strangely enough, uh, it has no optical warping because the slight curvature of the glass seems to kind of purify the reflections. And you can see here, even strangely enough, the reflections in these elements are virtually straight. And then it becomes this just very strange artifact, one of the kind of uh, pieces on display inside the museum. Most people don't even know what it is because the angle of incidence is such that you can never look inside of it. And it's any kind of space where you can get to. So in the evenings, it's kind of like the light that goes from it when the space is being occupied by uh, From an environmental standpoint, um, it should be noted that uh, we work very closely with uh, Transolar and as a team uh, and Petro Blades, uh, who uh, all work together to come up with a very interesting solution to the solar control problem. Because of the diagram of Park C, which has this kind of bubble and bubble diagram, we took that as an opportunity to exploit the double walls. So even though there's no coating through the glass, we have a thermal buffer on the whole perimeter, which has a chilled seal and it has cyclic vents, basically tempering the air in the cavity all the way through. Now for direct solar control, there's a whole series of custom spider coated fabric curtains which sit inside the cavity so you track all the sun, hold that heat, and then vacate it back. So it is actually a fully operational dynamic cavity wall. And what I'm interested in about that is that it's still in the service of a very specific architectural and poetic idea. It's not following the kind of web of the uh, inevitable two-tone cavity wall uh, where you, know, you, know, you need all these specific bells and whistles and it converges on a particular aesthetic. Not that I'm against that, but I, I'm interested in architecturally what can do. Um, I think we're running out of time. I'm going to uh, jump ahead. Is that all right? Because I, I always have much too much content. <laughs> Sorry. I want to show you this. Um, this project is kind of compromised from the outset. Uh, it it uh, I don't know. Does anyone know the story of this job? Um, it's the Gaz Island race track on the Uh there was originally kind of a placeholder planning concept for this building, which included two ellipses uh, straddling the racetrack. And uh, the initial architect that did that had finished basically some basic layouts for the hotel, uh, before the services diagram of how the building was built. Uh, it wasn't that far along, but it was far enough along that uh, they didn't want to abandon it. But they did want to abandon the architect. And then they had a competition in the US, which hasn't to won. Uh, it's the same client as the Al Raha Tower. And it kind of snuck up. It just came in and uh, Hani and Lizam just did a quick sketch on how to do this project. And the idea was to simply respect the current planning, extrude the two towers up with these kind of twin ellipses, merge the whole thing over with this kind of uh, uh, hairnet type of um, structure, and then build out kind of like a base uh, plinth uh, to handle a lot of incident facilities. And then to kind of blend the whole thing formally using a very kind of asymptote like language. <clears throat> but from that sketch uh, evolved a lot of kind of very, very interesting opportunities to synthesize things. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you, which I want you to think about because it, it doesn't always happen, but I think it will happen more and more and more. Uh, everyone understands the cost of money. And the cost of money is a huge driver for everything that we all do in the construction business. Uh, 
whether it's your own equity, it, time affects your return on equity. Whether it's borrowed money, it affects the amount of interest that you pay. To a certain point, it affects the survivability of the project. And as you know, in the last uh, year and a half, so many projects have been destroyed, and, and a lot of people have lost a lot of money. A lot of people have made a lot of money. A lot of vulture guys have come in and done very well uh, taking up uh, distressed projects. This project, 900,000 square feet, it's not small, was executed from the concept design stage when they won the competition to opening day for the first race in 22 months. Now, I don't know how many of you are involved in design trades yet, but that is unbelievable. 22 months would be already fast as a normal construction schedule for this particular project, let alone the design stage of this project. So you're basically taking a design stage of 22 months, a construction stage of 22 months, and superimposing the two, and ask yourself, what does that look like? What is your role in that process? very, very interesting. And the most interesting thing about it, it's very achievable. Now, I understand there's a lot of cash behind this job, but when I actually look retrospectively at the kind of process that it was engaged in, it was reasonable. It was quite familiar. Actually, a lot of people didn't seem that kind of stressed out. I mean, there was a lot of uh, kind of intensity, certainly. There was a lot of people employed in that fashion. But I think it's because um, there was a fire alarm who was asked to make decisions quickly and to not have turf wars and to work collaboratively because they didn't have a choice. And sometimes that kind of like threat of being removed from the project or not being paid or being sued or something is a great motivator to work together. Now, in this case, from day one, uh, we knew a full team. I mean, these I knew they're the prime, by the way. They hired the executive architect full construction documents, full information model. Very technology worked for them, front worked for them. Uh, Eric Bridge did the link bridge for the building. Uh, we had Shai Bergerman do the grid shell engineering. We did the grid shell skin, uh, along with all the other curtain wall. But when the team got together, uh, the design team came together within like two weeks. You know, Asimton just called us and said, okay, I'm really ready. It's going to be a wild ride. We're like, okay, let's go. Uh, everyone else wanted to do the same thing. And then we had the contract. Carillion, uh, Alpha Town Carillion, is a joint venture. British construction manager guys came in, flew to New York, they all had a big workshop, and everyone just started throwing stuff on the table and said, Who do we need? What do we need to get this done? And we were like, We need the best contractors in the world, we need them here today. Everyone's like, Well, hold on, is that going to lose our competitive bidding? Uh, I'm like, Yes. Is. You're going to get into a nightmarish uh, negotiated contract, but get them in day one for free construction services, pay them for their time, get them to work. You own the intellectual property, you only want to kick them out, get someone else to do it. Trust me, we'll go for it because this job is worth it. You're like, yeah, everybody goes for it. So, from day one, how do you set up a deal to make sure you get all that free construction service? And we're like, who do you have? Well, it's going to be still a good job. Found the bureau from Oscar, nobody else. We did hire a bureau, we did hire a Wagner Bureau's advice. So Wagner Bureau was on plane there in about two weeks, out of the workshops, on the job from day one. Uh, and then about two and a half months later, after some sort of political uh, infight, uh, Gardner was also hired as the contractor. So Gardner took on all the metal panels, the, uh, the, the sunshades, and all that other stuff, uh, but not the glazing to the grid shop. The glazing to the grid shop was also um, uh, Wagner Bureau. Uh, although it wasn't self-evident uh, in the first go. Uh, also, say, uh, my friend Brian Stacy from Airplane was on board uh, to mediatize the entire skin, because every single panel on this, of course, has integrated LEDs. Uh, we didn't have time uh, for uh, off-the-shelf lighting, so um, Airplane brought in a guy who's now a good friend of all of us, named Tommy Wooden, who's a uh, four-hire industrial lighting designer. Tommy just came in and started working on lighting design for day one, concrete layouts. So, GT was on board for full information modeling, and GT eventually got a contract on the contractor side with the first really to do construction process modeling. And the construction process modeling was absolutely what had to happen in order to optimize 
all of the false works, the scaffolding, the sequencing of everything on the job it is an absolute logistical nightmare. So this cast of characters, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I don't seem to say the wind tunnel study guys got brought on early and started working in a level of discomfort that they normally uh, now, you normally have full geometry, and then they go away, they do their work, you know, three months later they come back and say, here's the results. We're like, no, we want you to do a desktop study in five days, and we want you to do another desktop study in five days, we want you to work towards a model that's going to be 90% accurate, and then we want you to do another model thereafter, and we're iteratively going to use all of our design assumptions from this one the study, in incorporating wind shell design, cladding design, everything, and we can finalize that this is later if we have to. Everyone started getting into the questions of material available, the grid shelf, what steel sections are we going to use, what can we get right now off the shelf. Um, we looked at everything, really. Um, so with the grid shelf, uh, I keep calling it a grid shelf, but it's not a grid shelf. Okay? It's a bending frame. It actually has a primary X structure going all the way through it. Uh, and then it has a secondary two-way span infill structure, so it looks like a grid shell, but it's a quadrilateral mesh that follows the bending structure of the And the reason for that is when the design surface is set from an aesthetic standpoint and an environmental standpoint ahead of time, therefore it was not structurally optimized for clear span. Even Schleich Thurman had to have their head bashed against the wall for a couple of years to appreciate that it was not structurally optimized. Which was kind of difficult to accept because in a very pure way, I mean, they're the best, and those guys are just like, this is this is this is like you know false religion. There's something wrong about this. And they're like, deal with it. It looks good. So what you're looking at here is a GT images, uh, which are basically color coding panels of like size dimension. Because a client at the first instance just said, like, look, there's no way that every one of these five thousand panels is going to be unique. Of course, right? There's no chance. People are like, yeah, okay, so how many is too many? 50? 10? 20? 5? They're like, try with 10. There's just no chance. Try with 10, which is like, man, completely stupid. Um, so then we try with 50, it still looks stupid. Um, and then we try with like 100, and uh, the offset geometries from the grid shell were creating eccentricity to the strut geometries that were a problem. In the end, the struts governed, and we then unified every panel as a kind of uh, standardized constraint back to its nodal frame, meaning all 5,000 panels we need. And it was built that way. Now, if we didn't have Dr. Miro on board, see, Dr. Miro being kind of tapped up like the rest of us, we said, no problem. It can be done. So actually this here is basically collapsing all of the panels in the family on top of the back. Now, you know, secretly deep down, and in his end, he really, really, really wanted all of these panels to be raised. Because the diamonds just don't do it. So of course, we very conveniently told them you can't make glass to a point like that. This is man-made concern for free glass. Uh, and you have to raise. Oops. Now the radiusing opened up all sorts of opportunities for further optimization, which made sense. So um, this diagram here, just turning around a bit, uh, basically said, what if we support the glass on two points, and then we have a subframe to the glass? What if we support the glass on four points uh, without well, with a subframe as well? This depends a little bit. And what if we hold the glass on two sides, and then we kind of can't leave the other parts like a shingle? In the end, this is the only one that made any kind of like uh, uh, engineering sense. Because the range of panel sizes on this, because of the geometry of the skin, uh, and we weren't in total control of the optimization of that, because the foundation points were fixed at minus three, so it's part of the building foundations. That locked in fixed points from which the rest of the geometry then had to conform. So we had a plan for the ellipse, we had fixed points on the ground, and basically the geometry got manipulated over and over and over again. Uh, and there's a lot of inputs, I won't go through them all, but of course, glass size and thickness is driving maximum aperture. Structural density and the number of welds and the optimized weight of the steel is driving the grid. Uh, certain lines of force and geometries within the grid and the surfacing of it drives this. There's actually a lot of stuff, of course it's aesthetics as well. 
Uh, this little diagram here was like a stage of fantasy in the month four, when we still thought maybe the panels would all be motorized with a servo motor, and they could all flutter and chair at the same time as a human projector was on. And when the client's uh, owner, the British guy, um, the rep, uh, we told him that we had to have a cooling fan in every node in order to keep the temperature down. Uh, he said, like, forget it. And we thought that was probably a pretty good idea. Uh, but this is the version with the kind of built-in <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, now that they're fixed, at what angle are they fixed? Uh, do we vary it, or do we start doing kind of algorithmic sculpting that we do the angularity throughout the entire original? In the end, a lot of those studies were done by Asimov. A lot, a lot of studies. And what they settled on was that a standard degree of rotation of 20 degrees for every single panel was desirable. Now, that angle, of course, means the glass is dipping around its central axis of rotation, and it could hit the steel ridgehog. So we had to offset it by 625 millimeters, so that when it came down, it wasn't too much. And at that point, you have two struts coming in at the angle of rotation, and then you have one strut coming up here, or I'm sorry, one strut coming down, and one strut coming up. So you start developing this exception plate language, which has the lighting on it, and we'll continue. So at this point, the frame is steel. Steel doesn't make sense, eventually it becomes aluminum. Uh, you can start seeing the kind of quadrilaterals with the radius corners. Um, of course, four quarters adds up to about 360 degrees, and 360 degrees can be optimized into integer optimization. And what's interesting about that, eventually, if you standardize the radius of all the corners, if you optimize your cut by fixed integers, you actually end up starting to have a customized suite of corner plots, which are adaptable to any kind of infinitely variable panel, regardless of the four angles and regardless of the actual length. So there's some interesting things that started to happen. Uh, this thing here is called Marvin, I don't know why. Uh, another player who we got brought in, uh, we could have done this, uh, TT could have done this, a lot of people have been asking me this himself. But um, I'm not sure if you guys know Duncan Jackson, uh, she built with Jackson. They were formerly the industrial design wing of Rinchard's office, and now they have a consultancy in industrial design stuff. Um, Duncan Jackson is just so cool that, uh, that he designed all the New York City uh, furniture. That's probably, I'll show you some of stuff. Um, got brought in to basically manage the optimization and production of these little housings, which were all in multiple like, uh, cast aluminum sections. Uh, there's another uh, very difficult part to this, which is when you have a wind shell uh, with all these things, all four segments of steel coming into the quad point are coming in at different angles. And what is the normal axis? How do you average out those four angles to generate the angle of the strut that comes out? Now that, if you actually do a geometrical averaging of all four angles, it kind of gets a bit kind of wonky as it goes through. And so Wagner Guerrero brought in their buddies, uh, you know, Axel Killian and his friends and stuff from uh, the University of Vienna to do uh, multiple levels of further optimization in terms of rationalizing all of the, the angles. And that's all of these guys here. Remember, all of this is happening in like, breakneck speed because everyone is really motivated to preserve this. So eventually we start getting final geometry. We start instantiating the geometry. We start actually understanding all the kind of subcomponents, breaking it into different families of responsibility. Uh, here's a typical drawing, very kind of pragmatic. So there's the node, steel section coming in. There's the standoff, the escutcheon plate. This is the housing. The wires actually go up through the steel, through the post, through the housing. This is the LED fixture, which basically shoots a four-color LED light down onto the glass at that 20 degree angle. So every glass panel now has a variable frit across the surface to allow for the kind of graduated intensity of the light coming down on the panel. And this was all studied in visual models. We optimized the whole grouping of the panels into four extruded frames, so you can see small, medium, large, extra large here. And then we go to the mock-ups. So very quickly, about uh, a month, in nine or 10, we had uh, full-scale prototypes being built. Uh, all the panels and glass were being done. Lots of structural analysis. 
speak that in real time. This pitch really tricky because a lot of the panels are kind of slightly undersung. Some of the panels are vertical, and some of the panels are sloped. And as they're kind of rotated in different ways, uh, the way the loads um, transfer off to their forward and point conditions is not even. So one panel puts more loads essentially onto one node, whereas so it's not uniform load sharing. So the way that kind of we basically have to do a complete once you once you set up the geometry, then you instantiate all the panels, you export all the panel geometries into a software package like Strand 7, and then our engineers that maybe so clear will do a global analysis of all of these plate elements and all of the strut locations wired in, and then we'll give a global set of reactions in Excel back to Shrike Bergman for them to actually calculate the software loads and the wind loads and the various different load conditions back onto them. So this is why you have multiple engineers working in different ways with kind of digital tools all at the same time. So now you're starting to see the actual frames, radius glass, standoffs, and these are getting to kind of final conditions. Now Vibrant Bureau takes over and they start doing their workshop drawings. And uh, this is basically almost every significant detail to the panel supports. Um, you can see this is kind of the universal bracket that allows for rotation. There's kind of a linear curve discussion. Uh, Slot the pole here, which allows these things to rotate around the plate. Um, now one thing that's particularly difficult on this, um, I'll tell you, is sand. Now, if we have panels that are like this, and panels that are like that, the panels need mechanical support. You can't just glue them to the frame. At the same time, if you're going to build this in a conventional curtain wall, you're going to build corner nodes, frames, even silicone and splice them together. I tell you, after a while, thermal expansion is going to open and close those joints, open and close those joints. And some of these frames are facing upwards. They're just going to collect water, they're going to, they're going to fill up with sand. Uh, eventually, uh, if you've taken painted extrusions and you've cut them, uh, eventually, if they open up, you're going to have exposed aluminum edges, which are going to corrode. So you have a lot of long term problems. Uh, so I want you to look at this glazing detail right here, which is what we wanted them to do, both aesthetically and technically. The, even though everything, every single of these 5,000 panels are unique, the laminated glass has an offset, offset edge on all four sides, including the radius, which means that there's now 10,000 pieces of glass that are all unique. And this is to allow for a secondary mechanical restraint to come over, pick up the inside light of glass, while allowing the outside light to be fully supported by the laminate. And you can do that because the laminate is a continuous surface of adhesion, whereas the structural silicone is a line of adhesion that has more limitations to it. So in the end, you get a frame that's coat planar and flush with the free glass and looks completely smooth. Now, to extend this even further, all of the corner nodes, after being machined, were dovetailed with all the aluminum extrusions and welded. This is aluminum uh, corner to aluminum extrusion welding. And the corner could not be a casting because casting, well, trying to weld cast aluminum to extrusion aluminum is pretty tricky. But forged aluminum, and I know that it is basically you take a raw block and you put it under a mold under high heat, you're not actually casting it from the liquid, but you're just reforming it under heat into a specific geometry. And I'll show you that geometry in a minute. And then once you weld all of the edges of this frame, you can grind it smooth and paint it as a continuous panel. So there's no more failure of the seams, either structurally or for corrosion purposes. And um, I would say most curtain wall contractors in the world would never, ever, ever, ever do that or oppose it. But Wagner Hero comes from a culture of welding. And in fact, they felt more comfortable welding anything. So our choice of fabricator in this instance kind of allowed us to go in, in, a, in a kind of direction that, honestly, as consultants, we would never propose. To propose welding into aluminum is just like, it's a way to find a way to exit. 
you know, but once you're in this process, and everyone's got their hats on, and they're very focused on all the issues and all the results, people actually do remarkable things. So this is one of the four things. So check this out. Since we've optimized everything to the same radius, we can make donuts. And of course, a donut is 360 degrees. Right? And we can cut it into four pieces, unique to that particular panel. Every four digit is one panel, and then the integer optimization allows the CNC to know these things in four segments, and then here they are, and each one's layered. Now, each one of those was then CNC milled with the hole for the strut and for the counter baffling, which allows the aluminum extrusion to slide over it so you can weld it together. And then here they are, basically templating each of these pieces. And of course, the four legs of each of the arms of the extrusions of the panel are unique to every panel, because every panel has its own strange geometry and its own unique length. But having the corner standardized was actually pretty useful. So here's the final welding piece, fully ground down and smooth. And then eventually the whole thing gets painted and it looks like a kind of formed piece of composite material. So then we're on the site. Uh, because we have so much desert landscape here, the assembly for the steel could happen on site. Same like the Hong Kong airport. Basically, you jig these things off the ground, you laser level them, you set your steel in place, weld your nodes, and then you weld it all together, you paint it, prime it, and then bring it on the site. Now this thing here, with all the struts and the plates sticking off of it, this is not connected to another lattice room. This is independently supported exactly in its XYZ position by a series of um, scaffolds and false works. And it's those scaffolds and false works, the sequencing I was talking about, that GT's construction process modeling team did all the analysis for. So eventually, then you have every single um, frame in place. And then what they do is they bring in individual stitch elements, weld those, and paint those on the site. So in the end, you're still pre-panelizing about 85% of the steel frame, or 50% of the stitch build, as it had to be. So this thing here is taking the gravity rope. And this is an image, because you can start seeing, here's one of the major steel lines going up here. There's one of the other major steel lines. That's aggregating all the forces down into these nodes and into these beams. And everything in between here is just a two-way spanning grid in between those primaries. So here you can see um, you know, individual frames, offset from other frames, holding those in. And it's quite an exciting moment when they actually start releasing the scaffold and letting the frames push all the load down into the ground. Of course, what you're looking at here is the marina, and the water will be filled all the way up to there. And then this structure will be just about two feet off the top of the surface of the water in the marina. So these struts will be coming down onto the water. It's kind of an exciting thing when it's funny this whole thing. And the rest of this is all just kind of uh, new tires, with the wall, and uh, glass balustrades. And then the lighting stages. So it never gets used for representational images. I think that's uh, the first time I thought, I think that's permitted. Um, but it gets used as kind of color fields and uh, signifiers for various kind of teams and events. And it's, um, it's quite pretty. Uh, I was also going to say, I didn't talk about it much, but this bridge structure here uh, is also a monocoque steel structure. Uh, many of you may know the future systems uh, of the race track, you know, steel structure. So uh, the central style is one of the other contractors that got involved uh, recently from Holland that got involved uh, to basically hammer uh, steel shells into their position and then bring them out uh, on barges uh, to the site. And they got crane lifted into place on a series of major steel beams, welded all smoothed together, and insulated from the inside. We also have this kind of frameless glass wall that basically dovetails perfectly with this. And of course, there's a very fancy bar that sits over the base track, not too far as I So, in my experience, I mean, we, we've worked on big things like China Central Television, other things before that are, you know, people have done these uh, remarkable stuff, like contractors and owners have said, yeah, okay, we'll build that. You know, and sometimes you didn't think you would. Uh, but the combination of being willing to build this and the speed at which it happened, I've never seen before. 
I tell you that person, I've never seen it before. And it kind of inspired us because it kind of said, really, um, it's about design for the team. And I know uh, our friend Scott Marble is on this right now. He's uh, trying to do a book uh, with Berkheiser about design and design, design production, design and assembly. And he's right. You know, it's this kind of first principles approach to ultimately what are the cultural origins of building? You know, we have a need, uh, we have a set of values, we have a community or an individual that has an aggregation of resources. You don't have resources in the building. That's the reality of it. So then those people are finding people to team with. They're finding uh, a group of individuals and companies that have kind of expertise in order to execute whatever it is that their set of values wants them to build uh, according to, I guess, you know, the idealized information. I was going to put a, a, a shout out to this guy. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever met him, Andy Clemmer. Uh, Andy Clemmer uh, owns a, a consulting group called Paradise Group. Uh, and he was one of the guys who was instrumental in selecting Frank Gehry for Bull Battle back in the day. And his practice is all predicated on, you know, he does owner representation, that's it. And what he does is he builds teams. He's very clear about that. For every project, he's like, who are the right people? What is the right approach? Maybe some people, you know, most people do that, but I don't think they do it with a kind of single-minded rigor where it makes a consequential difference. Um, so on that note, uh, thank you very much.
uh, by a friend and clerk I just mentioned. He himself can try it and push it and lead it and control it, but there's just certain kind of um, uh, a certain kind of vision to synthesize very complex and divergent uh, needs aspects. I mean, just whether it's program or whether it's an architectural vision or whether it's uh, you know, just site conditions or whatever it is. I mean, there's just so many issues to deal with. Uh, architecture is is uh, they, well, architects are the only ones that can do this. But I I think uh, that. Complaining or binging or lamenting a kind of loss of influence is uh, counterproductive. Uh, and I think a recognition of uh, real competency is important. Um, I would say, and I've said this many times in the this evening, that ultimately, if you're self critical about your own capabilities uh, and ask yourself during the project, what what uh, right do you have to be at the table to contribute? I mean, it's a difficult question to ask because then you're basically saying, well, actually, I'm only good at doing this and I only know how to do that and uh, I would be very honest about what I can do. And then you have to start asking yourself, who's not at the table to answer all these other kind of questions? And big architectural practices just simply build out divisions. They hire more people, they buy people with special skills and uh, that's the way practice can build. So when you look at large practices and how they have become larger and larger and more successful, it's, I think, simply because they're very direct at acknowledging the need for that kind of diversity and the need for the leadership at the same time. They're also very good at kind of uh, bringing in uh, consultants when commercially they particularly don't want either the liability that that consultant has or they don't want to invest in certain kinds of uh, specialized skills that they don't have the business volume to sustain. So there's kind of a self-organizing relationship between specialist consultants and architects. That's quite natural. Uh, so, in short, I would say the architect basically is the only one who can occupy the center of the process to creatively lead uh, a kind of a non-linear, determined process towards a successful building. Yes. Uh, following up on that, I'm curious, given the number of boundaries which are towards the explore area today, conceptual, professional, technical, uh, what would you recommend uh, pedagogically uh, to, to enter the arena in which you, you have uh, exposed us? What would be the first 5 or 10% that you would offer in an architectural program along these lines? How would you tackle that? Pedagogically? Mm -hmm. um, Well, uh, I think it's a difficult question. <laughs> the, the, so the, 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 the reason is, uh, um, I think it's a big box. I just think there's so many models that can work. You know? I, I do believe it comes down to so much the motivation of the individual, you know, to take what's in front of them and deal with it and then compensate for what they're not getting through their own actions. Meaning, you know, I think it is the will of the individual to engage in the reality and to study and study and study. I mean, for me, I know uh, I, I'm not, I wasn't particularly diligent at the University of Waterloo as a student. Uh, I shouldn't say this, but I failed my expensive materials course three times. <laughs> Not through uh, uh, perhaps lack of skill, but through lack of interest. <laughs> no, honestly, because I think, I think for architects, uh, contextualization of something is critical. So the seminar, for instance, that I teach at Princeton, which is um, not a core course, it's an elective um, at graduate, is um, uh, I didn't describe it this way. Someone described it to me as a uh, Harvard Business School case study approach to design and construction. Now, arguably it's a facade course. So ultimately, you know, once we're finished a three hour uh, you know, Vulcan wide mode download onto uh, students, uh, they will understand why 
there for these expansion tolerance with a certain element. But ultimately, uh, we're talking about how the budget is funded, rather than how the team is selected. I talked about litigation and arbitration. I talked about who was removed from the job. Uh, I don't go into too much dirt. Uh, but, but conflict arises, and I think it's really important to understand how conflict arises. We talk a lot about procurement, about the nature of the client, the nature of the architect, and ultimately looking around corners to saying, strategically, at this point in time, where do you want to build? What's the best way to get there? You know, and I would say almost every job we work on has a slightly different procurement strategy, slightly different scheduling. Uh, some projects we go very shallow at the front end, and because we know full well that it's going to be completely drawn up by one of the gigantic Chinese government contractors, like you and Dao and John Poole, we've got four or five hundred people in the workshop drafting. Can't compete with that. Although, on, on the other side, you know, I, that's why I'm pursuing this kind of uh, mass customized uh, information modeling approach to say, actually, can we compete? Not because I'm nationalistic, but because I simply don't want to give away my job to somebody else. I want to preserve it. If I can preserve it through intelligence and technology, I'm going to. And I think we're going to succeed, actually, at that. It's difficult. Uh, the other thing I did, uh, personally, is I traveled a lot. I lived in different cities. I lived in Toronto, and Vancouver, uh, Paris, Rome, Muscara, Singapore, Kyoto, and Hong Kong. And then New York. Uh, and I lived mostly, along with, those are all short periods, except for Hong Kong, which is six years. And Hong Kong, during 93 to 99, was a very exciting time. China was still not very open and on the criminal side not capable yet. Uh, so you had an explosion in Hong Kong and China, but without the ability for the domestic market to serve that need. And so you had uh, all of the major international contractors and critical contractors operating from overseas. So you had the Australians, Canadians, Americans, French, uh, Swiss, Japanese, uh, Russians, I mean anyone who could was trying to get into Southeast Asia and China. In order to build. And during that period, you had a massive explosion of construction, of infrastructure as well. It's still going on right now, but that was like the first phase. Um, and everyone I knew uh, was working on amazing projects that were getting built. And I know we're kind of geeks, but I mean, every weekend we spend time basically hitting each other's construction sites. You know, so the whole built environment there is like this kind of massive encyclopedia of construction and fabrication where you get this kind of visceral understanding of what it means to more comfort, it means to screw something up. And uh, I think that combination of uh, direct experience of fabrication, of, of uh, construction sites, uh, fast track design, um, and plus, I think people should, well, I tell people in my office, if you're talking to someone outside the office and you don't know how they make their money, you should just shut up. I know that sounds a bit true, but it's like, hey, if you, have, if you talk to a sales, first of all, does that guy work for DuPont? Or is he an agent for DuPont? Does he make his money through a salary? Does he make his money through commissions and sales? You know, what, what is a person's motivation when you talk to them in this industry? And, we, and because it's so forensic, you start understanding like a gradient of consultants, and you get consultants that do design build like us, and you get people that do other things, you gotta be sure what everyone's interest is. And sometimes you need disclosures, and sometimes you, I mean, the, I would mean, say the uh, 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 proliferation of non disclosure agreements that we have to sign out, which is any job. It's incredible. I mean, but it's uh, understandable because you quite never know where everyone's kind of interest are. Not to be cynical about it, it's not about being cynical, but it's about actually giving you the intelligence and the tools to engage people in the terms that they. I mean, I have so many architectural clients that have young people in their offices that, oh my God, do they know how to alienate this room? I mean, just requesting samples without offering to pay for them ad nauseum. I mean, it's just like, after a while, what do you think this is? It's just like, do you have any idea what it takes to make customized box samples? I mean, I mean, in our business, we tell all of our clients everyone that, first of all, you don't want people to owe you favors, you want to owe people favors. You want to basically say, okay, what we want is we want these samples, we want these prototypes, we want them on these terms, and we're going to pay you for it. And our clients sometimes win, and we're like, no, 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 you 
pay for it. Even if it's paying shipping and they offer you to go out for free, at least you've kind of done it with courtesy. And that uh, way of thinking um, begets a kind of law of civility. You get a very kind of civilized relationship you know, all the people's, you know, step on people's toes, and people are doing the kind of things gratis or on a speculative basis, it becomes very clear. So, pedagogically, difficult. Okay, thank you very much.